Krita is the first time I've actually introduced somebody before. This is very exciting. <laughs> so I had to write something down. He's also a very important person in my life. He's a PhD advisor. <laughs> so he decides what I end up doing at the next stage of my career. No pressure. Uh, no pressure at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so uh, today, Dave Jacobs, Dr. Dave Jacobs from UCLA, the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, is going to be talking. Um, Dave is a, a man of, he, of many expertise. He's a biologist, he's a geologist, um, and he studies kind of the coevolution of Earth and life on a variety of different scales using a lot of different techniques um, from early evolution of species to kind of the coastal processes and the evolution of, of habitats along our coast. Um, that's what he wanted me to tell you about. <laughs> but Dave has, is, that's, Dave does a lot of different things. He was traditionally um, trained as a paleontologist and he did his PhD studying the evolution of what swimming characteristics in Nautilus, fossilized Nautilus. Yeah. Um, shell shell form of fossil stuff. Yeah, fossil stuff. So, <laughs> he's done, he says that him and I have worked a lot in French Polynesia and Morea studying kind of landscape ecology and the evolution of the islands. Um, he's resurrected an uh, extinct uh, diving bird recently, the Labrador duck from ancient DNA. So he kind of does a little bit of everything. But today he's going to be talking about um, coastal lagoons uh, and kind of the history of, of coastal lagoons and estuaries and the fauna and how they both have evolved over time with you know, climate change, sea level rise, and uh, various other aspects. So everyone can please welcome Dave Jacobs. Thanks, Brenton. Please just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, as, as Brenton was saying, um, this is, I just took this off my website. It, gives you a flavor for how confused I am and how many different things <laughs> I wind up doing. We, we actually do all this evil uh, molecular stuff with jellyfish and things. That's one aspect of what we do. We're a lot about uh, form and biomechanics and things like fossil cephalopods. We've done a variety of things uh, related to the early evolution of life. But, um, and so when I first you know, came out here, I, uh, I had this affliction of being interested in both biology and geology. And I got interested in the coastal processes and was kind of uh, confused by the way people were restoring estuaries. I also kind of accidentally got into studying tidewater gobies, which turned out to be the most genetically differentiated uh, uh, coastal vertebrate. And I'm not going to get too much into tidewater gobies because uh, we have our own uh, local expert on tidewater gobies here. So um, anyway, so without more ado about that, I'm, uh, uh, let's take a look into the past. So there are a variety of ways to look into the past, right? Um, here we have a gentleman, uh, and this is uh, uh, down uh, near Venice Beach, looking up towards UCLA, as you can tell. You can see everything <laughs> is, is a lot, uh, it's very similar now. Uh, uh, but he is at, this, this gentleman is at a very large, two kilometer long lagoon, which you all know all about, right? You've been there, you, some of you may have been there, but obviously the lagoon is in there. The relics of it that are very interesting. So there's lots of things you can look at historical photos. There are all kinds of ways to investigate the past, both geologically and through historic information. Um, and so <clears throat> I'm mainly going to be uh, up here near the recent in this talk, but of course I have to dabble a little bit back here. So we're going to start about 12 million years ago with kind of a formative aspect of, of how we got our coastal fauna here in California. So it turns out our coastal fauna was a product of this of, of a dramatic phase of upwelling that was instigated by the first ice on Antarctica, or actually it's part of the second ice on Antarctica, but a dramatic expansion of ice on Antarctica about 12 million years ago actually led through a variety of feedback mechanisms to um, large amounts of upwelling. So this is a, a, a story, and there's a variety of reasons why our fauna here is the most diverse temperate fauna in the world, really. Um, instead of other upwelling zones, but upwelling is pretty related to how we got what we have. And we have a very uh, diverse set of, set of things. We have things like house and birds and cancer crabs, but also 
this one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish stuff. This is the genus <laughs> Sebastes, which has something like 140 species, about 100 some odd, 104 of them are on this coast. So you go to other places like the Atlantic, the two, the New Zealand, the Portuguese. Here we got a lot. So we have a very diverse fauna, and a lot of this actually evolved. It's a diverse fauna, but it's a relic. It's actually a relic of Miocene upwelling. And here's some other things that were, you know, here we have, uh, you know, Cancer digestris, the Dungeness crab in its native in its native environment, <laughs> <laughs> the tartar sauce and the lemon slice, and so so we have a, a bunch of different diverse and actually tropically interesting things that evolved at a particular point in time, and we can think about how you know our biome here was created. It's a fun thing to think about and try to interrogate. It's not so it's perfectly easily easy, and occasionally you have to do evil things like look at molecules, but nevertheless. Um, and obviously, there's all kinds of things that were produced by this upwell. Like most of the, uh, this was a time early in the 20th century, first couple of decades, when LA looked like this, right? So, went to the beach, oh well, you know, so I wiped his little oil. <laughs> actually, actually um, at this point in time, you know, so these habitats, things don't always get, I mean, as a scientist, I don't want to say things that are kind of good or bad, you know, uh, but, you know, if you don't like being covered in oil, um, then maybe things. Have gotten a little better in some ways. So at this point in time, dock workers couldn't smoke. Well, maybe that's good, but they couldn't smoke because they'd get blown up because there was oil flow. <laughs> so, so don't judge. Like, don't so judge. Don't judge. <laughs> maybe that was better. I don't know. Um, so we have things that were happening in the past that influence the future that are actually leading us to be able to drive cars or led to the, this huge amount of oil production that where California was dominant in oil production earlier in the 20th century. And still, most of our many monasteries in LA have kind of oil wells stuck in here and there. But then we want to think about this kind of phenomenon. Well, T, that's kind of a lot of ice on Earth, you know. So, not to get into too much detail, here's a lot of ice in the Sierras, all the northern states. I mean, you think they're cold now. <laughs> Minnesota back in the day, when it's got a, you know, over a mile of ice on it, yeah, kind of chilly place. So uh, by putting all this water in that ice, you make, you make sea level go up and down, which is what's going on in the last million plus years. And so you can sort of see that. And again, um, we'll be talking a lot now about this last little part of this curve as we come out of that. So if we think about what things were like, say 20,000 years ago in California, when you know, you step outside here, say hello, hello to a ground sloth, etc. You know, and, and also you could almost walk out to the Channel Islands so that maybe, you know, you couldn't have named the University Channel Island. University. <laughs> uh, Channel, Channel Island, Peninsula, so Channel Peninsula. Island because there was a little sea. Anyway, so you get the idea, you know, sea level was down 120, 130 meters. And so, you know, San Francisco bed? No bed. So big trout stream running out to the shore. <laughs> So the world has changed, and our sea level goes up and down. It has all kinds of implications for where we are and what has happened to us. And uh, yeah, but then sea level came up, and it came up, you know, in, uh, a lot in, in, in uh, what's going to be in the late Pleistocene. And then you get this flat part, um, which is the Holocene. And if you look around your landscape out here, you go, you're on the edge of a very flat bunch of stuff, and that flat bunch of stuff. That's the plant land that people are conducting agriculture on a few hundred meters in that direction. Well, all, all, all that flat land is actually a response to the stability of sea level. So sea level has, has actually had feedback. So our you know, whole landscape you're in, the hills you know, are not that, but everything, all that flat area, that's all in some kind of <clears throat> dynamic equilibrium with and dictated by the recent uh, constancy of sea level, or relative constancy of sea level over the eight, nine, ten, ten thousand years. So that period is interesting. I just threw these slides in while we're waiting, probably assuming that uh, uh, Brent would mention these ducks. <laughs> um, so anyway, you know, that, that period of time, about when sea level uh, was coming up, it's likely that some of the first people got here. They followed what, what has been known as the Cal Highway, or it's recently been argued as the Cal Highway came down the shore, seeing this is how America was first populated. And so we can go to all the middens, say, on the Channel Islands. And one of the things you find are bones. 
of this flightless duck that you're all familiar with. It's called Candides, you know it well right now. You don't. <laughs> the last one was eaten 3,000 years ago. Here's another duck that um, was uh, killed off uh, in the 19th century by people hunting in New York and littered you know, near Long Island. It was a little too easy to, to shoot. And so, and, and, and so we have all kinds of interesting questions that we can begin to address by getting sequence from midden samples. And so we were able to, uh, this is uh, Janet Buckner who did this work in my lab, and she was able to identify where these ducks fit on the entire tree of ducks, even though they've been dead for some time. And so one of the things we find is this Candides thing, well, it looks like a sea duck, a marine duck that should be feeding um, in the sea, and blah, 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 except it's sister to all dabbling ducks. So we realized that we, you know, uh, people around here, you know, ate this unusual lineage, and it's gone. So we have these kinds of things that we can begin to discover about the world by interrogating it in new and different ways, right? So here we know about a lineage that seems to have been important in the, in the tree of the. And we can then see, you know, what goes on when people arrive. One of the things is there, it turns out there, if you look around the in dredge material, well, there's stellar sea cows in California in material from the last glaciation. So stellar key sea cows are big manatee-like things. The last <coughs> ones that were found alive were found in the in 1740, up in these only uninhabited islands in the North Pacific, Commander Island. And they were eaten all eaten within 20 years. Apparently, Native Americans or the first people got here, like the two men. Um, <laughs> they, they do not occur in the midden record for food for some because they ate them first. Uh, the ducks are interesting because trophically they appear at least as high as otters based on isotopic arguments. Wow. And so what that means, I'm not quite sure, but that's kind of the next step in our interrogation. All right, so now we're gonna think about that flat uh, time of the sea level rise and this flattening of the sea level in terms of estuary formation and lagoon formation. One of the things that uh, uh, you, can, you can sort of see is that as sea level comes up, it floods the landscape and it makes spaces like this is Tamale Bay, anybody familiar with that? It's a one person man. <laughs> Anyway, so this is, this is the, the valley of the San Andreas Fault, and when sea level came up, it flooded it, made a big feature. So there are all kinds of features that are made, uh, and some of them are formed by coastal processes, but nearly a huge majority, and I will make this point, and hugely important in California are these hydraulic estuaries that form at the mouths of rivers or streams, and are produced actually by erosion when the streams flow hard. And so that's what most of our habitat is, numerically. And there's a tendency to sort of not think about that. People, in fact, are always converting these to tidal systems in the name of restoration, which maybe they should, if they want to do that, maybe they should call it something other than restoration, or change the meaning of the word, or something like that. So <laughs> anyway, so, th so that's part of what I'm gonna talk about today. And uh, we also uh, wander around catching things. Uh, this is actually not right. <laughs> but there are probably very similar scenes that could be taken. Except that uh, this is about, uh, this is uh, El Carenta, it's uh, just out of San Ignacio on the outer coast of Baja. So we've, one of the things that I've had the benefit of, I guess I said something about California in the titles of the time, but perhaps I didn't just mean Alta California. So I'm using this in a sort of more generous uh, way to, since we have, I've been able to sample estuaries from here to Nayarit on the far side of the Gulf of California. And so that's been very interesting and we've had found, gotten a bit able to obtain lots of material to work on. So we can also do genetics and compare that to the aspects of the physical processes that are, are changing. Here's just some of our sample one localities. So one point that one can make, and a lot of the fish we work on, not all of them are gobies, but one of the interesting things about these things is uh, they're better than warblers. <laughs> so what's good about warblers, these warblers are fun because we have this niche model where we can see that they inhabit different parts of the tree in the boreal forests of the north and then they fly back and down. They're very colorful and people like them, bird watchers like them. But what's better about gobies is that actually their choice of habitat affects their evolution. It affects the habitat the habitat affects their dispersal ability, which affects their evolution. So some of them are stuck in closing systems, 
Some of them are in open systems where their larvae can get around. So this is, once you understand this, you can then study different processes because if you pick the right goby, you can look a certain amount of time into the past. So certain gobies are good for very recent processes and uh, so forth. So this is related to this kind of thing. This is a closing lagoon uh, from Santa Barbara Coast, looking at, I think, at uh, uh, Santa Cruz Island. Then you have things that are really close, and you have things that are intermediate, like a lot of estuaries that do have tidal processes, have habitats, like channel habitats, that are partially isolated through the, t through the tidal series and of big and small plants. Is that San Diego? Uh, this is in San Diego, yeah. I think mm -hmm. this is in Mission Bay. I stole the picture somewhere. But yeah. Good. Yes. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we can then see, all right, where's that? Uh, uh, San Quentin? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, in that bay. It's, okay. It's okay. So anyway, the, here's an open estuarine system where if you have a, a, a goby reproducing in the stream, uh, this tidal on, uh, stream on, on a tidal channel, and you can catch certain gobies there, they will disperse very well uh, because their larvae are immediately delivered unto the sea. And so they can have good larval dispersal where the things in confinement are maturing hmm. in the lagoon and do not disperse so well. So here's one that's not confined, and you can see these patterns are from, you know, evil uh, DNA stuff. <laughs> so this is a, this is a mitochondrial gene, and we, which you can come and look at. We look at the same gene and all these things, and we can see this pattern. You have these very similar things, very long distances apart. And if there is any difference here, it might be from inside the Gulf of California out. Mm. Not much difference in in, in the lithness here, and the lithness over time. Here you have a little more difference, right? This is a one of these intermediate confinement things, and so we can look at intermediate sorts of structures. And we're gonna look first at that uh, kind of thing as we talk. And then the, this is the Tidewater Gobi, which is really Rococo. It has very local kinds of genetic units in it. Uh, and this is, it also has these management units that are defined therein on the basis. And so we're actually down here in this management unit that's related to particular part of the tree. So the color bands are different management units. They are in this case. Um, yeah, so, so this clade uh, here is, where is that here? <laughs> so that's the one we got, and later on we'll talk a little bit about that. So this is due to the confinement of, this, of these in those lupins. That's why they are, are dispersing, so, or not dispersed, and are so locally evolved. All right, so it turns out if we look at this sea level history, steepness matters. Tectonics, or the geology of our rather annoyingly active coast, make very steep coasts, and because some of them are fairly new coastlines, if you will, in a tectonic sense, and a lot is going on. And so that matters, uh, that produces steep things, unlike, say, the East Coast. You want to think about the East Coast, or you'll go astray in California. <laughs> um, so what we can see here is that steepness matters for estuaries. And so this is just bathymetry color coded here. And we can see that some places, there's a few places here, even up here, which are fairly shallowly sloping uh, for a, as you go down to say 120 or 130 meters, which is where sea level went down to in the last glacial maximum. If we think about that, we can see, oh, well, some of these places are very steep and there isn't going to be any habitat. And so you can do this a lot and try to pick places and figure out where the habitat could persist. And we color coded everything. This is work that was done with Greer Dolby, uh, uh, a student, a former PhD student and all that. And so we can find out where these guys could have had refuges. That is where you could have had full on open estuarine habitat at low stand. Uh, 20, 000, approximately 20,000 years ago when sea level was substantially low. And so what you find is basically um, in this region, there's only this one place, north of Conception. And if we look at this coast, basically there are two regions. There's north of Conception and this area north of Huhinia. And so you can begin to see how these habitats in these general areas persisted through time, but uh, earlier on there was no habitat in the intervening LA Basin or other areas where historically 
or at least a, lot, a couple hundred years ago, and there was plenty of estuarine habitat. We've obviously done some things to some of those estuaries, but uh, that's, you know, the, and so then we can go and look at uh, some genetics of things that don't disperse very well, a couple of gobies. This is a, not, this is a, not a goby, it's fungulus. Fish. It's a fish. It's a fish. Yeah. Um, and we can see these patterns. We can see actually uh, what we can do is demonstrate that there's actually mixing, and we can do that via a variety of models and so forth. Um, and so, not to get into any detail about that, but we have this pattern where we can see mixing in the genetics, and I will, uh, you know, and we do various kinds of fancy modeling to test various hypotheses, whether the dispersive theory is continuous what the isolation by distance or some other hypothesis and we were able to show that compared to other reasonable hypotheses the one of the two refuges explains that coastal or the one, that, one of the, in this case this model has three refuges here here and here explain the pattern that, that we observe so we can do various modeling all right let me stop there well why don't we move back to here any questions about this stuff Anybody catch on? <laughs> yes. Um, for the DNA studies, why do you use mitochondrial DNA versus genomic DNA? Um, well, uh, we, there's various reasons to use, uh, we started off using mitochondrial DNA because it's easy um, and it was sort of a state of the art some substantial time ago. We're actually new, now doing whole genome analysis of a lot of things. We're doing a variety of studies which where we use genomic analysis. And one of the things is the patterns that we're talking about here were done with genomic data as opposed to the mitochondrial data where you start to discover some of these patterns. So this is actually done with microsatellites, the, this, this uh, uh, mixing uh, that we had, that we were able to demonstrate, right? Um, now we would probably use another technique even beyond that since there's lots of uh, new ways to get lots more data mm. and actually sequencing. It's getting awfully cheap, so you can just go out and start sequencing everything. So why not? It does, it's compared to the rest of the cost of just like feeding people like Britain. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really, it, it's getting very cheap. So we can now get lots and lots of data, right? Um, then of course you have to figure out what to do with the data, but uh, we now have a lot of ability to, to address these questions at least to have the resources in, in terms of data. So, any other questions about this? Yeah. So could this, could this data potentially be used to map the population dis distribution changes with climate change in the future, or is it primarily looking at past data? Well, we have, we don't, you know, we don't have genetic information that's inherited from the future right. yet. So, um, I think in that sense, we're looking at the past here. But there is sort of an, an annoying implication here, and that is that, you know, this bad, good, bad thing we keep talking about. Well, in this kind of scenario, sea level rise is good. So it's probably not good because we're here, and, that, and, and it's not only not good because it will be bad for us, but we've also altered the landscape so that it will be bad for everything else too. Right. But nevertheless, right. You know, if we weren't here and sea level were rising, it would make more estuarine habitat or it would rejuvenate estuarine habitat or it would make it back into more open habitat rather than closed habitat. So one of the things that happens when you take these habitats is initially, <clears throat> when you flood the coast quickly, you make big open beds. And then as the coast, coast evolve and you wear them down with waves and streams, deposit sediment, they mature. What mean? And they, and, and these- But you're matured? <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> at least uh, it's mature. Um, so, so anyway, um, so 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 you can see that. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that there's this change through time as the as the coast evolves in the Holocene, when you have that flat sea level, and so you get towards more and more closing systems, and then they're only maintained by stream flow. And so that that dynamic occurs where actually we have lots and lots of closing systems quote unquote naturally uh, as a historic time. And so, you know, if you wanted more open systems naturally, uh, you, would, you would raise sea level, which we're doing. Okay, well let's step a little further south. And here's some things that uh, people care about, because they're big and invertebrates. And so, 
on the other hand, they're not all that big because this is the smallest cetacean in the world. And the last time I read something about this, there were 10 left. Yeah. So there's not very many left, and they're probably going to go extinct. Maybe they are extinct. I mean, uh, it depends on how long I talk. They may be extinct. <laughs> So, but in here, are a lot, and one of the reasons they're extinct is because people fish for this thing, or what's left of the population of Tutuaba, because the gallbladders are the more very valuable in China. So even though there are attempts to restrict fishing, it's hard to restrict fishing when the gallbladder of this thing is worth more than cocaine. And so that's one of the problems in the Northern Gulf, and it has to do with fisheries. And I make that point because there's another problem that we run into, because we are not doing anything that anybody ever we can see as charismatic. We're looking at small things. We're not looking at these taxa, but we're looking in the same region. Uh, we're looking at the delta, and this is a species here that, as Brendan, in his ever so kind introduction, pointed out that we've resurrected. Well, what does it mean? It's a resurrected species. Uh, um, it, it's not a godlike kind of thing. You actually, it's actually involved taxonomy. So. Basically, this is our goby, a big goby, this long jawed mudsucker, Philippines Mirabilis. And it, was, it, it lives all along the West Coast and into the Gulf of California. And even here, right next to the delta. So we'll talk some more about this delta edge. But this other goby, which doesn't look, uh, when I first caught these, I go, what are these? And I don't think they're these, because they have no coloration, they actually have a different shape of the head, etc. And they live in these incredible silt channels. So these things are there's 10 meter tides in this delta. This delta is of what, what river made this delta? Anybody know? Colorado. Very good. This is like river of the Colorado. And we don't talk about it because it's in Mexico, right? So it's kind of too bad because it's, uh, but we did, we have actually rather damaged this place by taking all the water out of the Colorado. So that's part of the argument that I'm going to be making here a little bit. So anyway, these are all the sites that it's ever been collected from, and except I just collected it from one more. Oh, really? um, so did you get it on that trip? Uh, I got it on the previous trip. Cool. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, we actually got one on the last trip too. Cool. We got it by putting our hand in a <coughs> crab burrow. Where they, they live in burrows, so. And it was a nice big one too. It's cool. So, um, so yeah, so they're, they live in the Delta and they're resurrected in the sense that they were taxonomically made the same or synonymized with Galicus mirabilis, the long jawed mudsucker. But then we realized that it certainly wasn't the same and in fact it's quite genetically different. It's probably been separated since the formation of the Delta or about 4 million years. And so uh, we put, got brought the bait name back from synonymy, aka we resurrected. So it's Galicti detrusus. And if you go to the Delta and find one, you'll be one of the um, few scientists ever seen them, because these are all the collection records in the world. Not that they're all that rare. So the Delta is changed because we turn off the water. So we have these dams, there used to be a lot of flow, then we built dams, a couple of episodes of flow, but basically there's no flow. So it's no fresh water getting to the deltaic system. So one might envision how that would have uh, effect. Oops, what was? What was there? Um, so uh, there's another fish then we can talk about. And so one of the things obviously is that things dry out. Again, we can look at this delta edge over here with all this salt because there were times when this whole flood plain is covered with fresh water rushing out as the snows melt in the Colorado drainage. But we now take all that water and it's running out of our faucets in the building here. So um, here's two atherinids uh, in this genus called Pictes. They live in the Gulf. Um, and this is work done by my uh, former master's students, uh, Clyde Lau. And so um, there was one paper on this describing this species in the Delta. That's a Delta endemic. And so we decided to work on this as well. So we looked at, at museum collections and museum collections, of which there aren't that many. Admittedly, there's no evidence that these things hybridize. But in the collections that I got more recently, we can see this morphology. And here the blue is, a, is up in the delta. And uh, the red is further out in the gulf. So it's kind of weird. And the, when the, you know, the end of the gulf is in the middle. You can see both sides and it's the end. 
And so we can see on all these morphologic measures, we can see uh, that there's a, uh, a, a blue part and a red part, but only, but it turns out there's also at number two here at the edge of the delta, there's an intermediate morphology. So it looks like these things are now hybridizing, hybridizing. And we naturally think that this is related to having turned the water off. So you have no longer fresh water, you have salt water and saltier water in the delta. So it's a, even though you have tides in there. And if we go and look at these, we can find some evidence in mitochondrial sequence uh, that these things are hybridizing. And then we went and got two other kinds of molecular data, microsatellites and some single uh, locus uh, data so we can look at hybridization. And so, um, not to get into too much data details, here's a, here's a summary of the data using principal canone components combined with some other techniques. And we can see we make an axis that's phenotype and ax an axis related to microsatellite genotype. And we can see uh, how there are these two clusters. And <clears throat> we can see that the, what we find then is that, that uh, um, in the hybrid zone, on the edge of the delta, we can also identify through that single locus that there are these intermediate forms that are hybridizing. And we can also find uh, that there's individuals with, uh, which are uh, in the center of the delta that are forming, uh, that are also have the other genotype. And so we can demonstrate that there's hybridization going on and that there's introgression from the open gulf species into the delta species. And so this was interesting to us and we published on it and uh, we should do some more work on it to document it better. But it may actually be a general phenomenon since people have turned off the wall of water and nearly all the, all the drainages of the rivers of the world and they're starting to do more of and more of it even in Southeast Asia. So they're turning off the Mekong and all this other stuff. So you can envision there are all kinds of problems like this that relate to things that were separated as ecological species by differences in environment where we're actually making the environments the same. And then the risk here is these things will hybridize and you'll lose a species. So you have progressive loss of the species. Here's another interesting case of the same sort of possible problem. Here we have blue crabs in the, that only live in the delta. They're widespread, they're related to these widespread orange crabs. And so that's, uh, and it turns out that's, we're trying to figure out how they are ecologically separated by looking at the genes in their eye. Um, so there's a, so I won't talk any more about the upper delta, upper gulf and delta. If anybody has any thoughts or questions about that, that would be cool. Uh, uh, have you studied the relation of how hybrids compete with uh, natives, or is that something that is So um, this paper we just published is the second species ever published on this. On this. So it's nice to think of all, you know, I think we all think of science as though a lot of it's like been done and there's all kinds of information out there. Well, you step across the border into Mexico, it's not true. I mean, it may, it's probably not true here either. For instance, uh, for instance just found all these microspiratorial parasites or, or, or infections in, in gobies that hadn't been studied before. And so there's lots of things that are unknown. And so there's actually, in, a, in summary, very little science done. And on this species, there are a total of two on, on uh, Colpethes hubzii, there's a total of two references in the scientific literature, one being the description about 30 some odd years ago. So the answer is no, uh, and so you're welcome to join up and go do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, there's lots of really interesting work. No, I know, you know, maybe hard to get funding. You might have to hang out in San Felipe and talk somebody into you know, running some, some, some tanks somehow before you do it. <laughs> if you're good at that, go do it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, get on it, man. <laughs> so no, I'm serious. I mean, it's you, you know. So you see how this works. I mean, it's, you have to decide you want to do it, and you have to have enough gumption to figure out how to get it done. Any other questions about this? Well, we got about a thousand more slots. Let's <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. And I won't talk so much about this, the, these, these highly defined gobies, but we will start to talk about the estuaries and lagoons of California and the processes in them. So one of the things that's important when I was making fun of East Coast estuaries, when I got here, as I said, 
I didn't understand why people kept thinking that things were, that were open and tidal were necessarily natural because I started studying tidal ergodies that were actually in these closed and removable systems. So this was kind of a, a set of, kind of a, you know, dissonance or whatever that I couldn't really figure out. And so basically there's significant bias to the way people have historically looked at these things, largely we're, because we're a nation that's been historically dominated by the East Coast and where there are these big open estuarine systems and those are the dominant type of estuarine systems. Not that there are no lagoons there, you can find them, but they're relatively few. And so in California, it's the other way around because we don't have summer rain. The streams don't run in the winter, in the summer and the lagoons, the, the estuaries all close up and form seasonal or intermittent lagoons. And so, but we'd like to know more about this. Um, so, you know, here's some examples. This is Devereaux Slough, you can see how it behaves differently when there's some of these things that you can see dry out quite a bit uh, seasonally. And so there are various different kinds of behavior. And so we'd like to understand these things a little bit better. So one of the things is, you know, people say, oh, it's open, oh, it's closed, oh, it's, open. it's a little too easy. So as a good scientist, I like a lot of complexity. So here we have this, uh, <laughs> so, so what we can see here is we have this stat now of eight, or maybe it's nine things, since there's a zero bit, um, categories that we can divide these coastal water bodies or places where water accumulates at or near the coast. And we can say, all right, well, you know, is this classically a place you can get a bigger boat into? Uh, is there a deep opening? And so we can all, go all the way down to things that are impounded by the beach burn or impounded by a dune or, or very high. So there's a whole set of coastal waters that are actually not necessarily the coastal waters people think about. But then there's all kinds of intermediate states. And so if we could be able to actually get data that were diagnostic about this sort of thing, and uh, so you can do this from images. So here I made a set of sort of characteristic ones. It's animated, that's good. It's um, multimedia, dude. Yeah, and they will hurt you. So uh, um, in any case, so here's a, uh, you can see, uh, well, you can't, this is going to be fast. But <laughs> you have ones that are, uh, for instance, in the, uh, that are open, more open, and ones that are more closed at various heights. Let's bring back up through here quickly. Let's take, um, so these are, here would be something that's new then, and it could fill all the way up. Here is something that's perched behind a beach berm, and I'll give up. <laughs> uh, but you can see that there's a set of, uh, of things that we can look at. And so we can get a protocol together to, to figure out, you know, how high these things are. And we can use this in for perhaps a variety of different media to try to assess and compare using a standoff or a somewhat standard set of characterizations. And so we come up with some numbers. We can also <coughs> set up a thing where we can talk about the details of what is going on. So, the beach berm is definition one, and that's how high the impoundment height is by the beach berm or the dune or whatever is impeding uh, flow. And then we can also figure out what's going on, whether it's drooling out, whether it's dried out, whether it's full to the brim, whatever. So we have other kinds of characterizations. And so we can go and look at places like Nautilus uh, Lagoon and compare it to Devereaux Slough and come up and realize that we have uh, different averages. Uh, so Devereaux is more closed um, and we can see that there's actually have slightly different descriptions of the amount of water in these things at different times, especially since there's a oh, microscope getting a message that something wants to control my computer. Anyway, I um, don't know why that is, but we'll see what happens. Um, don't so, trust it. Yeah. Uh, so one thing we might want to do is look into the past. So. Here we're looking into the historical past, right? And so this is looking up in, on, on the Santa Barbara coast. Here we have a place where today there's a nice little lagoon uh, that was affected by the Thomas fire, so it's not so nice anymore. This is Carpinteria Creek. And here's uh, Carpinteria Salt, Salt Marsh, which is an open tidal feature because it's maintained as an open tidal feature as a UC reserve for people to study. But if you go to the back <laughs> of this map, you can find the low tide line. And you can determine that this one is actually Kind of neither open nor closed. It's closed in the low intertidal, so it's an intermediate condition, at least as mapped, whereas this one I interpret as being perched. And actually, historically, these could have communicated through this area that's now low, 
which is Wislow, and is now a housing development. So great place to live since it's actually under high tide. But anyway, be that as it may, you can see, <laughs> or, or I, I probably shouldn't have used the word tide there, like that. But anyway, you get an idea. So we're looking at 19th century maps that are the first maps of the coast. And we can begin to deduce processes. And so the point here is to begin to infer process, not just habitat type, but process from these interrogations. And so that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do there. Here we are, not far from here, up towards uh, Point Wainini, uh, in one of these uh, teachings from, the, uh, from 1857. And we can see in this case, the region around Oxnard, this system is actually closed off by a dune. And so depending on how you want to score this, this might be a dune dam system, uh, but it may be able to overflow into the next system, which is actually another point that you find out, that there's a bit of delayed water to move around the landscape. So I looked at 259 of these on the T-sheets and looked for them between the, the uh, Mexican border and the Bay Bridge, or thereabouts, and we can see this is the distribution historically of this process. We can see that there's dominance of these types and very few of uh, some other types. So they tend to be perched and closed, and there's few others. And if you looked at Mission Bay, which is protected from wave action, you can see clearly that the ones in Mission Bay are more open because, uh, excuse me, this is San Diego Bay. Within San Diego Bay, the drainages don't tend to close, enter San Diego Bay, because San Diego Bay itself has no wave action to close, or less wave action to close them off. So you can see this, how, this, how this kind of thing works. And so we can look at, you know, the distribution of dune dam features historically on the coast, or the distribution of high dunal features this on the California coast in the 19th century from these tap species and interpretation of them. And it turns out that um, if you look over here, you can see here are the two systems that were fully navigable. Actually, you could get a boat in the Alcorn, amazingly enough. Hmm. Um, so I've scored two of these as fully open. You could not get a boat in the Mission Bay. You could get, you could get one in the San Diego Bay, et cetera. So they only two really. And so you get the idea. As we go up the scale, me, me, there are very few of these lower intertidal fe open features as you go up, you find uh, some more of them. So you get an idea of the distribution of these things. And again, the ones that are most common are in, in between these two uh, sets. Uh, but uh, anyway, so um, another thing to point out is if you go to places like here's Santa Barbara. Oh, gee, um, I didn't know that it was a one and a half kilometer long estuarine, or in fact, closed lagoonal feature in Santa Barbara. And, and that's because you're not over 150 years old because uh, <laughs> it turns out here's again that feature. But if we go to the next survey in 1870, it's gone. So this feature is gone by 1870 because people have gated it out and turned it into farmland and other domestic uses. So gated it out means you use a tide gate to keep the tide from coming in. So you can begin to see how some of this might be important to think about as we consider what actually was around and what should be around and stuff like that on our coast. Here it is in 1900, they had a racetrack there. Anyway, um, so. There's still a racetrack there. Was that? There's still a racetrack there. Well, you would know that. I would know that. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway, um, so uh, you get an idea then of some of the ways you might want to begin to think about and measure some of these things in historical context or with modern photography, or be able to compare those two so we can see what's happened on our coast, and it's something which we're working on. So. And so obviously people are all doing things like this is uh, Batiquitos, it's a closed system. You can see some processes here. Here's some little drainage out through the berm, but it's closed, right? It's nice big, it's actually map is closed historically on um, like T-sheets and the early 20th century mapping, but in uh, but then um, it was restored. That's true. And so it, this is restoration. And one of the problems with this kind of thing is there are processes. You get you jetty this open, and then you have this huge tidal flux, and this delivers the beach under the lagoon. So you have a flood tide delta building in the lagoon. So people know all about this when they're building a marina, but they don't seem to know all about this when they're building a restoration. So restorations always of this kind seem to require a lot of diesel fuel to dredge them out uh, a lot and keep them the way they 
uh, to be, so they're restored. And this happens all the time. When, when, when Bayona was first opened, you can see the flood tide deltas building into it back in the day, and that lagoon I started with in the talk, that's a long feature along the coast. So this is not a new process. In fact, Newport Bay, a lot of the structure seems to be built on a whole series of flood tide deltas that probably formed after the major floods of the 19th century uh, built or uh, went through that area. So yeah, so we have a lot of systems that close like this. And these systems have an interesting dynamic. They're actually made in years like this. Here's 2005. Here we find that there were 20 days with over an inch of rain in that year. So it was raining. And in years like that, you wet the soil, you get the streams running, and then they run hard. And then they erode the lagoon out so it's deep. And so then you have kind of normal, a more normal year, maybe 2006. And we can say, oh, well, we have a few uh, year, uh, days with an inch of rain. <coughs> if there's enough of those, approximately, depending on the system, that may breach, it may open to the ocean, there may be some interaction. And then you have other, other years, when, such as 2007, well, we don't have uh, any days with more than half an inch of rain. So since I've gotten to California, it's rained more than 40 inches and less than four inches. And I've only been here 25 years, so <laughs> I don't know what those data mean, uh, but they mean that there's probably a very high variance and we don't actually know the limits to the distribution. So anyway, what we can see is that these are very variable and they produce variable processes in the lagoons. And the lagoons are therefore uh, harboring interesting taxa. Some of them function when it's open, like this daggone sculpt in here. Some of them, like the Tidewater Gobi, is a specialist for these closing systems. And others actually use them, in, 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 such as the red-legged frog, when it's possible to breathe when they're fresh water, which they are much of the time. And so they're actually harboring lots of, lots, of, uh, lots of biology. And again, this is like, uh, why Tidewater Gobis are so subdivided. Uh, you can see that every headland in this, these data, these are microsatellite data, and this is a program called Structure, and different colors are, we, you pick the number of things you uh, want the, the program to divide the data into. <coughs> and we can see there's a number of regional entities in the, in the set of things. And uh, if we pick four or six, the emphasis is on headlands. If we pick more, we can see these processes where we're having founder events between different systems. So these things that are all one genotype seem to have been recently founded. And so that seems to be what, what, what's going on when you look at these data. This is kind of interesting as a control because our good friend Cam Swift, um, I believe in 1994, if I'm correct, took 52 or 54 gobies from the Ventura River to Malibu. And because Malibu had been extirpated. And then we can see the subsequent recolonization of Malibu so this is the founder effect, this is the CAM founder effect, and then this <laughs> is the founder effect of the colonization of, of Topanga from Malibu subsequently. So you can see that we, so we have some interesting controls, anthropogenic controls on what we can see here. And so we can see that there's a lot of response, there's a lot of detail uh, going on here in, the, in these populations of this species that I mentioned before that is confined to these lagoons that seems to be reproductively isolated. Um, other things we can see is that they're from these old maps uh, are that you can get different kinds of connections between systems as I was showing. So these are connections that are uh, behind tectonic structures and there are others that are outside of uh, along the coast. So this is a historic map, which I guess is sort of uh, pretty great, showing the Santa Ana River, the biggest river in Southern California, joining here now with, with um, Newport Bay and exiting, and this is how the process was going on for uh, in the late 19th century. That was also something that happened uh, for a while. And so this is what it looks like now. We have Jebby Bis River out here. This is an isolated embayment. So we can see that we no longer let these systems migrate or move around the landscape. And this lateral confinement is something that hasn't been really examined, but it's an important contributor to a lot of the changes in the behavior of these systems that should be interrogated further and is a big change in how our landscape functions. Um, so I won't uh, go on too much further, but here we are looking at the southern tidewater goby 
which is distinct from the northern Tidewater Gobi, as we recently described, and Fred and I and Cam uh, and Brian Ellingson described this new species that exists only down south. And in this case, it only lives regularly in some of these blue places on Camp Pendleton. And many of these other places have either been altered to be open, or have been altered, or people plan to alter them, uh, or they're modified in various ways. And some of these alterations are actually a product of quote unquote restoration, such as the one about you. So, so you begin to see how you know these things are effectively related to the, the taxon in question. Oh, if that were to go. And I seem to have lost my presentation, which may be, may be a good thing, I don't know. <laughs> There you go. Right. Now I can see it. All right. So let's think about what's happened to lagoons. So here we are, maybe about here. And here's a set of lagoons. And so if you think of that Ventura unit, that Ventura LA unit of Tidewater gobies, uh, there are still some gobies in one, one of these regions here. But you can see there's a whole series of lagoonal features that if you go and drive around, you won't be able to find because they're not there anymore. They're now either agricultural land or suburbs or what have you, so there are features here, etc. So we can see how this landscape has changed. So this, this genetic unit presumably evolved in a situation where there were, you know, two or three times as many lagoons that there are today. And so that's, um, we can also, so what are we doing about this? I think these lagoons, small lagoons are important. And so what we're doing is making various observations and we're hoping to have help from all of you guys in doing this in the future uh, to try to figure out how these lagoons are operating in detail and to encourage even modest restoration of these small systems because they're where people in nature can really interact. Most of them are right near the road. People in nature interact whether we want them to or not. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is a small system called Sycamore, which is historically had tidewater gobies actually under this bridge. So this endangered species was living in a puddle under this bridge in the dry season until it got to dry and it dried out. So we've been taking lots of observations of systems like this, photographing them and dropping lines from the bridges and measuring depths of water and to understand how these things are responding to this process of uh, high flow, which actually rejuvenated this habitat in 2006. So it blew it open, dug it down. So I went, went in here and where you could walk out, it was 12 feet deep. So you had a lagoon that formed that was large and persistent for basically through multiple years. And so you could do things like have things like red-legged frogs mature in there, that or goby could live in there, et cetera, all kinds of things could happen. But you might want to facilitate that by reintroducing red-legged frogs, facilitating tidewater goby migration, or possibly doing things to maintain these systems. And there's a number of other the others. This one is actually due to be restored, so it'll be nice to know how it's functioning and uh, so forth. This is Topanga, another one. This one is interesting because this is uh, not one that people like to think, think about too much, but this is Santa Monica Canyon. It's not always attractive, but actually um, we've got flounder in there. Hmm. So, um, halibut, excuse me, halibut in there. My bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I haven't caught any flounder. Oh, uh, actually, yeah, sorry, 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 but this is this this is um. But but anyway, this system is very different in its behavior because it has a lot of pavement upstream and channelization. So when it rains, you get a peaky flow and it breaches. The other systems don't behave that way, at least the ones that are quote unquote natural. That's because their drainage areas are 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 effectively uh, um, more permeable, it takes a lot longer to generate the flow necessary for opening, et cetera. So the dynamics are controlled by other anthropogenic effects. They're also controlled by things like fire. So one of the things that fire does is harden the landscape, so the drainage shift happens fast. So we've been going out and looking at these lagoons following this last fire, because it affected a bunch of them. Um, and we know that the fire affects streams and fishes and lagoons. Um, so I think, uh, I think I won't go on to any more slides. But um, yes. uh oh, what I don't know, it sounds important. <laughs> okay, so anyway, just to leave before I get further, <laughs> what's going on? So, um, 
So, so the point is that it's, it, there's this kind of variation, and we'd like to know what to do uh, about it. We'd also like to study the impacts of things like the Woolsey fire, which we're doing. So we have uh, been going out and sampling for eDNA, so we can sample not just with nets and other mechanical means and other and observe some of these photographic points, but also uh, are are able to do things like uh, recover another measure of all the different kinds of taxa that are there. You know, a perfect measure, but we can look at the bacterial composition, how that varies through time, how it varies in these different systems. We can look at the fishes that were there. We know that some fishes have killifish. Some of these places, we, we fish them, we find killifish in one, we find top smells in another, we find Gambusi in a third, we find- Do you want to quickly just describe what eDNA is? To sure. Just real quick. Sure. eDNA is short for environmental DNA. So just take a sample of something from the environment. In this case, we're taking water and, and or sediment samples from the bottom of these lagoons. And you filter out the water and, uh, and then you extract the DNA from the water. So then like you go and take a tissue sample from somebody you know and ask some particular question, you now have all the DNA that happened to be in the water. Well, it turns out organisms that live in the water, some of them are very small, so you may filter them out anyway, like bacteria. But other things, other larger things, like our cells, are continually shedding DNA. So we're shedding skin cells, we're shedding all kinds of things. So this, if you know, probably if you drain your bathtub, sending a lot of your DNA out, right? So it, so there's always DNA from whatever's there in the in the system. It degrades a little more quickly in water. Some of it accumulates for a little bit longer in the sediment. But there are a variety of things you can do with that DNA. And what we're doing here is using a series of methods to try to get a rough assay of everything that's there. You could also develop set a particular question where you can say, I want to find for sure whether Tyler Adobe or some other thing has been there. So there are ways to do that as well, but they're slightly different methods. So we're using just an eDNA thing to generally categorize what's going on and relate it to the physical processes we're measuring and the changes in the systems we're measuring, as well as the interactions between all these biological Bacterial, vertebrate, invertebrate, etc., which we can recover reasonably efficiently, and it's now becoming far very cost-effective, and in some ways, maybe this isn't quite true yet, labor less labor-intensive than some some other uh, other other mechanisms. Certainly, you can get a lot of information uh, from a lot of different groups of organisms that you couldn't get, so you can't go out there and look and see the bacteria are often identify all the invertebrates, small invertebrates, very efficiently. But this is another method to try to approach those. And so we can see how fires or other kinds of manipulations or human interaction or the breaching and closure of these systems is affecting the composition without having to have a, to go fishing every time, though you have to do other things. So that, that's what we're, what we're attempting. Uh, and in this case, specifically in association with all these factors, including the Woolsey fire, uh, where we have some, fortunately, pre-fire samples, but I've got some early post-fire samples, a couple of them should go out again pretty soon. It's getting, gotta go it's out there and sample tooth, again. Right? Yeah. So anyway, so I think on that, um, and no, we're going to go and sample again. Um, <laughs> I'll stop talking.